and that's what we were predicting. Now, the people that are working on this would be guys like Dr. Lowell Morgan, uh, Tommy Mello, who actually develops uh, the coding for what's called computational fluid dynamics. This is really high-end stuff. It's stuff that's used to do analysis on, like, say, rocket engines and jet engines and, and so many other things. And um, we're very good at what we do. This is how we kind of make our living. However, you're going to find out that our predictions were wrong. So we did another model, which you're going to look at here, uh, right in this area here. This is our analysis of putting in one of our probes and see what the kind of thermal response that we get. And what the model is telling us is that the temperatures of the gas just off and around the surface of the anode should be around 23 to 2500 degrees Celsius, well within the constraints, or you might say the, the operating limits of tungsten, which is what the tips are made out of, a Langmuir probe tips. But what really happened, I'll show you here, what you're looking at here is the probe tip, and we're gonna play this video, and this is a very low powered plasma. So, <laughs> this don't. is where you say, now you see it, and now you don't. Langmuir probes are about 8,000 bucks a pop, and um, I had to make a telephone call because we pulled it out. Before I get into that, I just want to let you know the actual power at that time was 182 watts. That's 182 watt light bulb, imagine, okay? And we're going like, what is going on? So when we opened up Sapphire, we discovered what was left. And this is what the tip looked like after it vaporized with, uh, this is just the residual tungsten you see here on that kind of nodule, that's what was left of it. And everyone knows anything about tungsten, it takes about 6,600 degrees Celsius to boil it. To vaporize it, you need more energy and in thermodynamics, as some of you probably already know, there's a time domain associated with it, how much heat is lost in the system as well. So it's not just 6,600 degrees. If you're gonna vaporize it that quick, it would typically point to temperatures that are much higher than that. And uh, not the 2,300 degrees we uh, predicted because you know the, the, the tungsten should have heated up, might have started glowing a little bit, but it, would, it should have lived in there. Well, obviously it didn't. And um, this is what a tip looks like on the top, before and after. Now the white stuff is alumina, and it's melting temperatures about 3,600 degrees Celsius. So I made a call. Actually, I should back up a little bit here because I got a story to tell you. I called a company who are a great company. You know, I'm not going to mention who it is. <laughs> we had gone into great detail with them as to what kind of plasmas we're going to get, and they said, we have the probe for you. And so we bought two of the probes, and uh, we put the one in, and uh, we talked to them. We said, well, this is what happened. We showed him what was left of the probe tip, and he came back, and he said, your plasma's too hot. <laughs> I said, really? <laughs> you think? You guys, I said, I told us you guys knew and understood the plasma we have, and we went over this with you guys in detail. And I'm thinking, what am I going to tell Scott? Okay. Then these guys say, uh, let me know when you'd like to buy a new one. <laughs> so I called Scott, and I told him, <clears throat> we just vaporized the Langmuir probe, and we did it with only 182 watts. And we don't understand what's going on at Sapphire. It shouldn't have done this. And Scott says, uh, wow. Um, you know what that means? I'm thinking, I just lost my job. <laughs> yeah, it means that uh, our thermodynamic uh, modeling is wrong. I'm thinking I'm out of a job. And uh, he says, well, yes, uh, well, maybe. But what's amazing is it means that you have a lot of energy impinging on the probe tip. You might have an effective way of boiling water. And, at, and then he says, in his deep voice, do it again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking, <laughs> so we're all gone nuts. The guy just said, my plasma's too hot. The boss is saying, do it again. And I'm thinking, I'm going to have to spend another $8,000 on probes. These things, like 8000 I said 8000 bucks a pop, 
we got to get control over this thing because otherwise, uh, you know, we're going to burn through money pretty quick. So we decided to make a new one, bigger, stronger. <laughs> I'll put higher pressure nitrogen into the core and cool the core and make it all out of a ceramic to withstand the temperatures. It's going to work. So that's it. That's the new and improved Langmuir probe, much bigger, thicker tip. We figured that, okay, since the plasma is so intense, we don't have to worry about the small wire. We'll put something in thicker and see if we can get some measurements. And what really happened? Again. So I'm going to play a video here, and this is where we got some serious questions and Lowell got involved, but just watch what happens here. This is a macro lens. Everything looks wonderful and good. We're happy. <laughs> Adios. Yeah, that's what we said. <laughs> <laughs> well, it lived so far. That's good. Let's just keep it going. Let's see if we can... Uh... The motion that you see in a probe is from the forces that are in the plasma. And then it really did some amazing stuff. So we were happy. <laughs> it actually survived. But the thermonic emissions, as we're going to get into, that's what you call thermonic emissions. That's not, you might say, the plasma. The plasma's gone out by now. So this is just the radiation. This is the, the, like when you light up a tungsten light bulb, this is what you get. So the, the radiation here just grows immensely. We don't know right now why the color changes. We know that we're obviously we're getting other emissions in here, probably from the tungsten. And this is happening in like nanoseconds. So we go from this beautiful violet color to these colors. We don't know what this stuff is that's flying around in there. We think it could be copper and or iron or whatever. Uh, we were able to capture some of these images. But we would have to say that the atmosphere in sapphire is somewhat um, Hostile. <laughs> and what was interesting is the crater on the side of the anode. So we decided, well, you know what, let's take a closer look at this thing because we were still getting information back from the tip, which is good, which is good news. And so this is what tungsten looks like after it's been machined with diamonds, okay? It has a kind of a centered look to it, powdery look. And this is what the tip looked like after we pulled it out of the chamber. So we've seen some cracking with the alumina a little bit. We weren't too concerned. The bright blue color was kind of interesting. But we looked at a closer look at the tip, and we see the grinding marks from the diamond wheel. We didn't see any physical deterioration of the tip, and that was just great news for us. And we thought, okay, we've got something that looks like it's going to survive. And we took a look at the alumina, and it looks like it was starting to melt. So we knew that the temperature was around 3,600 degrees, maybe a little hotter, but still in good shape. And then what I did is I just took my pliers, and we changed the probe up. We just retained it, put my pliers in to pull it out, and it crumbled. <laughs> and if you know anything about tungsten, it doesn't normally just crumble. And I thought, well, we, you know, we've got a bit of a problem here. So I put it under the microscope, and I looked at it, and I said, gee, that doesn't look like tungsten comparatively to the two. There's been a huge change in its structure, but not on the outside. The surface on the outside just looked like it was when we put it in. So we started taking a closer look at this, and it was like, what is all this white stuff? And uh, you can see the fracture in the tungsten is very sharp. It's very clean. It's not like we bent it or anything. It just broke. So we decided, and this is when Paul got involved, he says, listen, I know some guys on the University of Toronto. Let's get this thing in and get some scanning electron microscopy done. So we did. And I'm going over the, the material in the tungsten. If you know anything about materials, what you're looking at here, um, well, the black stuff is, could be contamination. But the kind of um, geometrical shapes that you see there above that other stuff that looks like shale is tungsten. It looks like it was getting melted. 
That shell isn't how it normally looks, but this is on the inside of the tip. On the outside of the tip, it wasn't being affected at all. Not at all. When we did the scanning, when we did the SEM, it was coming back that it was tungsten. The molecular structure, the crystalline structure looked just like it should. We looked inside and this is what we found, and we found a lot more. So we take a look at the anode, that big crater that was left on the side. It was some interesting stuff. It was kind of like, okay, it was an intense plasma discharge, kind of steel material. So we thought, okay, this is kind of like, you know, it's really cool artwork. <laughs> we didn't see anything that was kind of, you know, too outrageous. We saw this area here, and I thought, well, let's take a closer look. I don't know why, I just picked a spot. And I thought, what the heck is that nodule in the center of the top of that mountain that's in the crater here? And this is what the scanning electron microscopy showed up. Now, if you know anything about this, when you have really bright spots in SEM, it usually means you have really heavy materials in there, heavy elements. And they start to uh, emit. So now I'm going to head it back to Paul, and he's going to go through SEM and uh, tell you what we found.